In the last video we talked about the causes of synchronization problems. Now let's talk about how to deal with them. To ensure data shared between threads is synchronized, we need to guarantee that no torn reads or writes happen and the threads can see the latest values of the data for a given point in time. That last part is a bit tricky. It requires establishing something called a happens before relation. But first, let's tackle the problem of torn reads. To help us battle this problem, the standard library in C++ and equivalents in lots of other languages has the notion of atomic variables. C++ standard atomic is a template class which ensures reads and writes to its value are atomic. You always see the whole value written, never a part of it. There are certain restrictions to which types are supported by standard atomic, which you can read in its specification. How standard atomic manages to do this is hidden in the implementation details, but usually it involves memory barriers. If you use it with its default parameters, you will also solve the problem of threads seeing the latest values of given variables. Technically, a global total order of memory operations is established, meaning each thread will see modifications to data in the same order they actually were performed in time. This seems obvious at first, but we've seen in our last video that this is really not the case with multi-threaded programming. But what exactly are those magical memory barriers which suddenly solve all our problems and how do they work? Essentially, memory barriers are instructions which tell both the compiler at compile time and the CPU at runtime to not reorder memory operations. So in essence, for the CPU, it means arranging reads and writes, or loads and stores as they are really called, in a well-defined order. Let's recap what reordering means. If you write two values to two variables, A and B, those values are actually written to the cache of the CPU core, not the main memory. The write to main memory will be performed at some later time. Nobody knows when exactly. It might be the case that the value written to B might be stored in the main memory before the value written to A. If you take a look at the timeline, this will appear that B was written to before A, while actually it was the other way around. That's called runtime reordering. Let's take a look at various kinds of memory barriers to see what it means. Each barrier is a combination of the type of memory operation we want to ensure will happen before another type of operation. We can therefore have four basic types of memory barriers. Load load, store store, load store, store load. The first one means all loads before the barrier will happen before the loads after the barrier. The second one means the stores will happen before the stores after the barrier, etc. Let's take a look at an example to see how this helps in practice. Let's suppose we have two threads working on the shared variables A, B and C. One thread sets their values, the other reads them. We also want the storing thread to notify the loading one that the values have been computed and can be read. We'll use an int for this. This is our first naive implementation. Basing on our previous video, what problems we can see? First, the notification int is not atomic. So let's use an imaginary type for now called, let's say, int atomic, which is not standard atomic for the sake of this example. Okay, so now that problem is solved, but that's not all. We still have the problem of reordering of memory operations. Even if the notification int is set, we don't know if A, B or C have the latest value visible to thread 2. And that's where the barriers come in. Thread 1 is storing the value of notification int after it made some operations to ABC, so we need to make sure all the memory operations happen before the store. Fortunately, we can do that by placing a load store and store store barriers between them. Those two give us the guarantee that ABC have their values visible to other threads when the notification int is changed. So, is that it? Is it enough to make this example work? Well, no. We took care of the reordering problem on thread 1, but we still have the same problem on thread 2. Loads of ABC on thread 2 can be reordered before the load of notification int. 
So let's apply the barriers again. This time we want the notification load to happen before all other memory operations. So let's use a combination of load load and load store barriers. Now our code works as expected. You may wonder if we need ABC to be atomic too. The answer is no, we actually don't. Note that when the notification is set, thread 1 already finished storing ABC, so thread 2 will not get torn reads. That's what memory barriers get us. In essence, everything here happens before everything here. This type of memory barrier usage is so popular that the combination of load load and load store barriers is collectively known as the acquire barrier. And load store with store store is known as the release barrier. If we switch from our imaginary int atomic to standard atomic, we'll get the same effect as said before. Standard atomic already uses those memory barriers under the hood by default, with some extra features. We can change the default behavior of standard atomic by manually specifying the type of memory barriers to use. In summary, memory barriers are such a powerful tool that they form the basis of our known synchronization primitives. Each time you use a mutex, set the condition variable, return a value from an asynchronous operation, you use a barrier deep inside the internals. Barriers also form the basis of what's known as log-free programming which is a very clever way to do multi-threading without making the threads block each other. But those stories will also be told. I hope you found this informative. I hope you learned how memory barriers work. Give thumbs up, click subscribe, and I'll see you in the next video. Peace.